Good afternoon, all. Hope everyone had a fun day out there in the markets. Just a wee bit bloody, eh, Gavin? Let me bring you up here. Uh, um, sorry, just uh, getting you up here. Other side, where's your request? Here we go. Kevin, you there? Yeah, hey. How hey. are you? Doing well. How are you? Doing okay. Yeah. Yeah. Did you get along some more of that those Dallas dollar dollar bills, y'all? <laughs> I actually <laughs> uh I actually didn't do any buying today, but uh no buying? Oh, but you uh patient, hey you patient soul. Depending on, on on where you are though, yeah. I mean that was a that was a big daily move. So Yeah, man. We had fun. Look at Mike T jumping in. How you doing, man? I think you're on mute, Mike. Just FYI, if you're talking. There you go. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Alexa, stop. (laughs) How you doing, Mike T? Thanks for joining Dude, I've been, I, I'm sorry, I've been uh, out for uh, four weeks of racing, so we've just been all over the country uh, practicing, 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 so. No need to apologize. We've, I appreciate you jumping in this afternoon, and, um, yep. you know, I think we had, we had some some folks that uh, might have a couple questions for you, but, you know, um, since you're here, uh, why don't we, you know, I got happy to kind of talk about some stuff, but what's... Um, was jumping out on your side there, Mike. I mean, obviously we got that bottom end of the risk range certainly keeps opening up, but um, yeah, we got obviously earnings on the horizon, all that kind of stuff. But uh, you know, what are you seeing here in the kind of I guess near term, and then I'll ask you longer term. Um, let me see. I'm thinking six cents. I see dead people. <laughs> I, 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 I am. All right. We'll just recap. Coming into this year, about November, I identified that this is the worst set that I've ever seen in my career coming into this year. Yep. Uh, you know, the more I thought about it, the more shoes that have to drop and horrifically. And then Ukraine happened, which basically, you know, we were already going to have a food crisis. Mm-hmm. Uh, now we're going to have a food disaster uh, and an energy disaster. So watch out if there's a resolution of materiality in Ukraine. I don't actually think it's going to happen. I think that uh, Putin is going to take Odessa, which is essentially going to make Ukraine landlocked, and then it's over. Uh, so they have the power to persist for longer. Um, also, you know, the more, the longer that Putin goes, the more probability that Europe as a union fractures, and the probability will get unbelievably high uh, after the food crisis and the winter energy crisis because what they're experiencing now is nothing compared to what's going to happen next winter and if he if Putin wants to hold this we will see material protest politics in Europe and um, and you're seeing it in the bond yields now I don't really know I just spent an hour and a half on a, a real vision call or what are they I don't know what they call it wherever that guy pumps the crypto whatever that program is um, and I just talked today about it. We talked a lot about what Europe's going to do. I think it's going to be some sort of rendition of an Operation Twist uh, to, in order to cap, try to cap the sovereign yields of Southern Europe. If you take a look at, cause I was looking at what sold off this market starting in November of last year. And I'm like so stupid because I just recently figured it out. It was... Italian and Greek bond yields starting to blow out from like 50 basis points to one 
in uh, in November of last year, and that's what took started taking down global global markets. So, uh, Southern Europe and Japan are the epicenter of what's going on. Like functionally, the real problem is a food and energy crisis that is spawning into everything, uh, which is coupled with uh, tightening uh, liquidity conditions uh, to the nth degree. So. Yet uh, along those lines, Chris and I, Thousand Air FX, we were looking at those this morning, to, or not not specifically Italy, uh, in Greece, but uh, you know uh, we were actually we pulled up the the Swiss the Swiss uh, uh, yields, right? And you know the the move that they've had. I mean, some of these European bond moves have, have just been absolutely epic. Um, you know, I think the Swissy went from like minus one ish. Uh, to where it is today, right? Uh, and then, you know, they hiked for the first time in 15 years, right? Like it's, you know, some of these moves have just been absolutely gargantuan uh, from what, from from a historical, you know, back-tested standpoint. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, yeah no, that, that makes sense. I, and then uh, when I look at the, the other shoes to drop as I get out my toilet paper roll, um, crypto the ponzi schemes as my grandma would say it grandma always held on to the i italian ponzi you know so i say that in memory of her uh the crypto ponzi schemes are blowing up and um one just like 1929 there was no regulation of the banks at that time and you just had counterparty risk galore. You had no idea where your money actually was. And I believe all the crypto houses are like that. And this is why you saw the three arrows thing freaking goose egg immediately. This is also why you saw Celsius blow up this week too. And that's a zero. Uh, a very smart account went and traced out their crypto movements and they had actually plowed hundreds of millions of dollars of their operation into the anchor protocol for Luna and Terra. Uh, the, that's another Ponzi scheme. Uh, weeks before it blew up, even days before it blew up, they threw a hundred million in. And <clears throat> the the point was, why did they do that? This is other people's money that they're plowing into this, and it's probably because. They're all one scam and they all know each other and they're all working together to try to keep the Ponzi alive. And of course they couldn't. And so they goose egged Celsius is gone. Terra is gone. Luna is gone. And, and I expect because most of these operations are founded by thugs, literally crooks and, and that they'll, they'll all blow up. They'll all blow up. And the, the biggest threat to crypto is the Ponzi schemes called staking. And by the way, there's no reason to own Terra or any of these other or uh, the Tether or any of the other things here without the staking because it's pegged to the dollar, allegedly. So how the hell are you going to make any money? The only reason to own this crap is because someone will buy it at a higher price from you. That's the thesis. It's a scam. And and now they have to get their money out uh, of this uh, of this staked asset. And as these stakings mature, uh, you will see no reinvestment and just comp everyone will be trying to get out. And they're going to gate it. Well, as soon as they gate it, it's over. It's already over. And once they realize that it's already over, which they probably do, they are immediately trying to take the money out of it, meaning the proprietors, get their citizenship in Belize and take the proceeds and try to hide there. And that's it. And you can, by the way, you can live very well as a billionaire of stolen money in Belize. Very, very, very. In fact, someone could commit murder. <laughs> you know who I'm saying. Oh, Mike. So, you've, taken, you've taken the notebook review to full-blown conspiracy theory narrative driven here. Um, I love it. Uh, so can I can I pivot real fast on you? Um, yeah. When you came when you, you came on a couple weeks ago, and we were talking biotech, and I just pulled up the the, the IBB chart, which I know is just you know general ETF, and um, you know it's it's basically at yeah, pre-pandemic lows. Yeah. And 
and just curious kind of on uh, maybe to get an update for the group on, in that perspective in terms of what you're seeing in that biotech space, right? Um, yeah. You know, the last time we talked, there, there was going to, you know, there are obviously, you know, there's a number of companies that you mentioned that were going to have to kind of finance to some degree and, and somehow get some capital to kind of keep their projects going. Uh, we'd love just kind of an update from your perspective in, in, in that arena. Um, okay. So the thing to look at, cause there's, there's a, there's really two worlds in healthcare. There is med tech, uh, HMOs services that are mostly around parts, pieces, and the delivery of healthcare. And then there's the experimental side of we're spending a bunch of money to make new things to treat people healthcare. And that's pharma and biotech. Now, pharma has most of the state uh, products that you can model and stuff like that. And then biotech, less so, though many biotechs are very, very large now. And they do have state products, too, that are of a biologic nature, meaning they're a protein rather than a pill. Uh, Now, the problem with biotech is, is that in the past three, four or five years, there's been a barrage of IPOs for new science projects. These science projects require constant funding, as many of them burn $100 million a quarter. And and they're going to have a really hard time getting it. So that IVB that you're looking at is a mix of stayed larger cap names and uh, the science projects. And all the science projects are down, you know, like, I say they were down like 40% this year, but you have to remember they were down 40% last year too. So we're talking about a huge cadre, uh, like gargantuan cadre of names that are down 60 to 80% year on year and, and yeah. still burning. And, I mean, the ETF, I mean I, the ETF alone year to date is down a hair over 30% and on a one year basis is down 32.9%, right? So it's like, yeah, you're, you're a hundred percent correct. Like it is, yeah. It, 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 yeah, it's not been a pretty place to have capital um, now, uh, in, in terms of like just owning the general uh, sector, right? The space is dominated by hedge funds and, 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 and there's a good reason for it is that the, the cerebral horsepower uh, within these hedge funds uh, greatly overshadows the capacity for the vanilla long guys. And so they basically hate this space. They love it because when it goes up, it's awesome and you can just be dumb money. And the benchmarkers hate it because they don't understand this stuff, but it could be a big piece of the benchmark and they all have to chase it. And we see that often, very often. Uh, but in moments like this, it's just agony because they don't so- have power to understand what's in it and what the risk is and yet they still have to own it because it's a big piece of the russell 2000 benchmark yeah. so but- mike uh, there's also a notion in the market right just similar to the crypto grifters a lot of these science project uh, teams are also grifters so any comments on that as the proprietor of the pink fund i am very bullish on innovation and, and I have great confidence that uh, this will, uh, we will get through this. And there is an incredible amount of value to be unlocked. As a individual investor, I will submit there are an inordinate number of scammers in the space. And part of my job is to not buy that. So, so thank yeah, you. thank you. Kidding. Look at sell side. CVM, they've been running this grift for 20 years of just nonsense, in my humble opinion. So, uh, and then there's many names like that, you know, just, you know, pump and dump. There's a ton of pump and dump in this space. Uh, But there is in tech too, you know, all these smaller tech names. I mean, we see it everywhere. Uh, Biotech's a little harder to figure because you really need to have a lot of science understanding to understand the risk and the possibility. So, so it's an amazing time. I mean, there's, look, there's going to be just like in 2003, uh, I believe these names are going to get down to such a violently low, horrific level that there's going to be a lot of money to be made. But 
there are shoes that have to drop between here and there. And one of the biggest shoes is redemptions, where funds get goose egged and the people want their money back. A lot of these funds in the biotech healthcare space, the funds are down um, 60 to 80, 60, 75 percent uh, year on year. And and nobody's actually redeemed much yet because they're so shell shocked. But I expect moving forward in the short term for uh, redemptions to accelerate meaningfully as credit markets go blotto. Could I possibly ask a question? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm not used to just jumping in. I'm usually the one raising my hand. Um, my name is Christian. I live in Norway. So I just have a question regarding the comment you had on the energy crisis for Europe. Could you elaborate a little bit on what that means, both for the markets, but also how you see it play out during the winter? Well, let's get to the heart of the matter, is that... Uh... Russia got their dirty hands on a lot of politicians, which you're probably familiar with, many of them German, if not all of them. And they basically decided not to have a zero energy policy. They decided to have a negative energy policy and rely on the Soviets slash Russia for their energy needs. And now he's uh, come in and said, well, now we're going to trade land for your energy needs. And right now, Europe doesn't like that trade. So we're in the scuffle right now where he says, yeah, you're going to give me land and I'm going to take it. And they're saying no right now. So if they continue to say no, um, you know, look, energy is a spot market. OK, so the price is whatever the market will bear. So it's it doesn't trade like any other market like you can get outrageous costs because you're freezing to death at home and you have a baby. And what are you going to pay for heat? Well, eventually you'll pay anything for heat. And the probability is that next winter, if this persists, that's exactly what's going to happen in Europe. They're going to pay anything for heat and the politics are going to get incredibly ugly if this persists. So um, does that answer your question in a nutshell? I mean, I'll just say it's bad. Okay? Yeah, uh, bad. You, you and probably, and yes. Sorry. The, the possibility of it being stupid bad is uh, high. Okay. And, and couple that with food. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, an, it's an, uh, you know, like I said, I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen a setup like this. Um, it's it's a once in a hopefully a once in a lifetime event, but historically unbelievably bad crap comes out of this. Yeah, um, I can tell you this much: that we produce hydropower in Norway. The cost is zero point one cent. I think and you guys are killing it. Norway's the best place on earth. That's why I own Freyr. Yeah, um, there's a catch to it. Uh, 75% of the population actually pays, what is it, to 20 cents. We pay 20 times the production cost because we send the power to Europe and import the European prices. That's how bad we have managed our own power situation. Uh, but the Don't question... The rule the, hmm? the population first. Everyone's going to become very nationalistic and isolation, isolationary. Yeah. That's very populist. So they will simply change the rules. But I wondered, if Germany sets up the nuclear power plants, is that a possible or viable solution to get rid of the problem they have, well, as you put it in, sold themselves into? Uh, yes, absolutely, though you'll have to call me in five years to tell me. <laughs> in other words, don't hold my breath. Thank but you. Shut down all their nuclear. That's German, because that was a great idea, because uh, Fukushima, literally yeah. the Fukushima, they shut the, it's on the other side of the world, on a fault line, on the water. 
just shot you. Honestly, there was so much lobbying that happened by Russia to get the Germans to shut down all their nukes for just this moment. This oh, was God. a decade long endeavor with a lot of money involved and they all took it. And the shame on the media, well, of course, always shame on the media, right? Mm -hmm. They are co-conspirators in the effort to fleece the world because they don't care. It's all about ad space and they want the most clickiest thing they can possibly get so they can get their ads up and get paid their money. We just saw this at the WHO, right? You know, China funds a lot of that. So guess what? You know, COVID's made by bats in a cave or salmon or deer, but never the actual event that happened because they pay their wages. And people will say and do anything for money. I am blown away. I honestly thought that sociopaths was a rare trait. I've known a handful. I thought it was rare. I'm wrong. In my and now, I'm going to be 50 next month, and now I know that I swear to God, a third of the population are sociopaths. They must be. Anyway, sorry, <laughs> you know, uh, Christian, I, great, love great, uh, no, great questions. Thank you, Christian. It's always great having uh, another European view. I know uh, you're 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 shouldering the the brunt of of the euros with uh, with with my, my my good friend Chris in the UK. So, Christian, thanks for joining. I really appreciate it. Hopefully that. Mojito is going and is going down smoothly. George, you got your hand up, and then uh, then we might just kind of reset the room and, and kind of refocus on on the notebook here. Kind of what's jumping out. So George, uh, go right ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your time, Mike. As always, uh, my question is a little bit different. It has to do with traveling and running your business. Um, what are there any tips or tricks to traveling and, and keeping all the funds running smoothly? Do you execute yourself while on the road or do you have a trading assistant back at an office? I have a trading assistant back at an office. In fact, I have a whole team back at and they're wonderful. Dude. Uh, it, it's hard. I, especially, you know, I, look, the only thing I can say, was it worth it? Yes. Max took uh, P2 and P3 at Nationals this past weekend. So, yep. Beautiful. But, um, but it is, it, it, it's hard. It's hard. Uh, I, I, I worry about managing pink a lot, uh, but I don't have a short book with pink. I have a short book with my own account. And, you know, I trade my short book an awful lot. And I miss stuff when I'm on the road because I'm literally working off my phone and I don't see all different credit spreads and things like that moving around. I just can't see it on my phone, you know. Um, so I'm, it, it's difficult. There's no good. The only good way to manage while traveling is to travel less. And, and that's it. That's really it. You just travel less. Or you have a thesis that's so big that you don't care. And you have, and, and, and you have the, the VAR ability to not care. Like if my book moves mm, 6% against me, I'll care a little bit, but not a lot. So that's, that's how I do it. But 10%, I'll be upset. So that's how I do it. But that's, that's a really great question. Yeah. <laughs> do you have a follow-up, George? Sorry, you cut out. All right, we lost you, buddy. See, he's you... traveling. Yeah, he is. He's in his car. So, uh, <laughs> I know he's opening up a, a new office down in Virginia, so he's an I, he's an RA uh, in New York. And, Thank you, um, or sorry, Pen I think Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania actually. Sorry, uh, George, you're in Pennsylvania, right? No, New York. Your core office. Yeah, I just said thank you. I probably hit the few button time. Hey. Oh, thank you. What are you? What are you P P P A P A. He's in P A. He's in Pennsylvania, right? Yeah. yeah. He, he runs. Go for P A. The Poconos. Poconos, correct. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And what do you? Uh, what does he do? He's a uh, he's an independent RA. So he oh, runs a, yeah oh, yeah, and then uh, he's taking over he's taking over a practice down in um, near Will near Williamsburg, Virginia, I believe. Uh, so he's that's uh, so he's kind of on the yes, road. A bit, a bit, he's on the road a bit more, Mike, which I think is really the uh, the, the crux the crux of that question and sort of trying to manage everything uh, appropriately. I, yeah. I I don't envy your position right now. 
I, I think look, the next leg that we're going to have is the hard part where margins, revenue, bad, bad, credit, bad, quantitative tightening, ultra bad. I mean, this is basically everything bad happening in 08, but without a Fed put. That's essentially what's happening. Yeah, so uh, B-Dog, I, I believe you came on. You probably have a question for Mike. Um, so I'll go to you, and then we'll kind of reset and, and that kind of thing. So go ahead, buddy. Hey, guys. Appreciate it, Rob. Yeah. No um, real quick, um, this is actually a, it's a question on Japan on, uh, on the eve of what's going to happen tonight. We'll see if they, uh, they take off the yield cap. But just kind of going through the implications for it, carry trades, um, Japan owns 17% of U.S. debt outstanding, um, of treasuries outstanding. And I see Bill Fleckenstein on here as well. And so I would love to get his opinion and, Mike, your opinion on well as, uh, as to the spillover effects of what could happen tonight into uh, global markets. Uh, oh, I can tell you. I mean, I've been fussing. about. I just did most of this call was about Europe and Japan and what they're going to do. So it appears that Japan set enough balloons to uh, reset higher the ceiling on yields. Uh, that, that's going to fail, too, um, uh, because uh, think about what's happening to the Japanese public right now. Import export uh, organically is up in the teens year on year. So forget about CPI inflation numbers. Just look at import export what the prices have done. And now for Japan's part, the, the import part, now it's whatever inflation is plus 20% because their currency just cratered. And, and so the real Japanese consumer for anything imported is going to be about 30% higher and probably worse for food and energy. So you are going to very quickly have an extremely angry public, in my view, and extra. And I, I said about the BOJ, it ends with pitchforks and torches on the front lawn of the central bank. And if that happens, um, we're we're looking at a a you know where they lose they actually lose control of either the currency and therefore the yield curve, meaning the Japanese citizens start to exit Japan. And they start buying UST, which is what you might have seen today happening, by the way. That might have been the front run for today. Uh, you, will, um, you, you will see a, a debt collapse in uh, Japan and China. Japan is the biggest trader with China. So you're going to see it first in Japan and then China. And see a, a, a serious, horrific problem with uh, overly indebted companies blowing up with very low margins. And this is really just the conclusion of 20 years of modern monetary theory uh, for the two countries. I'm sorry, that sounds awful. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, uh, you know. It's, Nice and sunny here on a uh, on a Thursday afternoon, Mike. You know, Dropping first bombs. round of the U.S. Open here in the Boston area. You know, life is good, uh, but not. <laughs> it is good. It is, but, but as you know, it can still be sunny as countries default. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Wait, uh, Japan dropping their currency by 20% versus the dollar is a de facto default. You just have never seen interest rates not move with it. And, and so I'm so curious what they're going to say because, you know, the jig is up. You know, the charade is over. You know, their goal was full employment and uh, 2% inflation, right? And that's what they've said the whole time, yet they printed the entire way. Even when they had full employment, they kept printing. And so... Now you see what's going on. Now you started getting inflation. <gasps> oh, wow. You're meeting your goals. This is a win. Mission accomplished. Wrong. We need to print even more. So erase from your mind what the goals are of the central bank, because it's a lie. Their job is to make their treasury look solvent, and it doesn't matter how they do it. 
Same with the U.S., same with Europe. And and that's it. And that's how these comp- these businesses or operations work within the government. It's, it's very upsetting that there's a bold lie in everyone's face and it's so obvious and nobody calls it out. And now it's beyond obvious. The charade's over. It's over. People should be irate and they will be when their energy and food costs are through the roof and currency drops 20%, which just happened in Japan. So I assume the irate is on the come. And we'll see how it plays out. But um, in short, it'll be funny. So keep good humor, sunshine and somewhere. (laughs) Exactly. And Eric, I see you, Eric Clark, I see you out there, Dynamic Brands. You had, uh, you you tagged me in a tweet yesterday, the day before. So if you got, uh, if you want to come talk to Mike, um, a good opportunity here. Uh, I did invite you to speak, but again, if you can't do it, no big deal. Um, Awesome, guys. So why don't we uh, try and, um, we got uh, other side, uh, thousand air effects. Why don't we kind of reset a little bit, maybe pull it back into the notebook and, you know, share what's sort of jumping off the page to us, kind of get back to the roots a little bit. Hey, Robert. Uh, yeah, buddy. Go ahead. Uh, I, I, I know Trend kicks us off and, and uh, absolutely. Uh, but yeah. if, uh, let me just, it's kind of why we have these calls though, right? Why we have these calls is because while most people follow the, the, absurdness of um i'm writing my month uh, my monthly and I, I i i call them rodeo clowns and <laughs> it, it, it'll be interesting uh, when i publish my monthly but at the end of the day these guys who who speak this garbage and they truly believe but people believe in these people and and they they don't realize they're being lied to but the primary reason we hold these spaces or you've started it and we have joined in over the over time is because we want to educate people as to how not to be in those situations. Am I, am I wrong in saying that? I mean, we want people to prepare and, and not be in those situations to avoid the negative BS, to, to preserve their capital, preserve their wealth. And, you know, we can kind of insulate ourselves as a group and a community. Everybody can join, but only some are going to listen, right? Yep. Yep, spot on. No, it's exactly kind of why, why we, you know, why we created this because we were kind of going through individually what uh, what we were assessing in, in our notebooks on the page, the pin sheets on the on the screens, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you can learn a lot more together than you can uh, on your own. So huge proponent of that. I think that's a great summary. Other side, and there's a lot here that um, are trying to you know put it uh, put it into practice, and it's very hard. So. You know, don't be discouraged. Um, you know, it's very, this game is, is, as Mike T knows very well for being very good at it, uh, but this game is very, very bloody hard. And, yeah, it's not easy. Um, yeah, it's not easy. So, uh, so absolutely good. Very good point. Um, Trent, you want to, um, you want to kick us off on man? Uh, yes, sure. So last week uh, during the uh, weekly notebook review, I mentioned that, uh, my sash shorts weren't working and that I was thinking of folding on them. But uh, fortunately, immediately the next day, starting <laughs> Thursday, <laughs> I, started working. I think that's, a, I think that's, a, the, that's a an understatement there, Dread. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Talk about a tale of two tapes. Eh? A week ago, it was opaque and maybe we were going to grind higher. Yeah, yeah. Not so much. Yeah. 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 Of course. And, you know, part of it was, I think I was lucky too, because in the morning when I was thinking of folding them, I actually got a bit tied up and busy with work by the time i came back to my desk to look at it at 2 p.m i was like whoa what happened you know all these sash stocks are like just down 5 10 12 percent so then i was like okay i'll hold on to them with my original thesis i was about to fold on them right now the second part was regarding i'd mentioned about china i'd mentioned about ashs and uh, uh, also uh, there was one more EWH, which is Hong Kong, um, in the international front. Uh, they worked out well as well. EWO, which was my Austria short, uh, worked out well. As far as um, commodities go, um, I got trail stopped out on my crude long WTI at around 117. Um, I was in an, uh, in on it at around 111, 112 for the futures um for some other commodities on nat gas i had a quick play uh, in it um, 
both on the option side as well as on the nat gas future side uh nat gas futures i had to cut losses but then on the ung option side it worked out as a very profitable trade uh the risk ranges worked out worked out extremely well uh the nat gas futures didn't work out as well uh from standpoint of rates <clears throat> i do want to highlight on rates uh, as we are going cross asset that there was a very significant move in italian bonds and for those who are not familiar uh basically what ended up happening was the spread of italian uh government treasuries uh compared to uh germany right so if you do a relative uh thing the italian ones uh, were trading extremely wide and that's called as fragmentation risk because the eu is not just a political union they're trying to have it as a monetary union as well so from or you know fiscal union as well so from that standpoint they wanted to make sure that uh, bonds of countries within them don't trade beyond a certain spread and in fact to that effect christine lagarde even today issued a statement that um, if these spreads widen further we will have a flexible pepp kick in um which will help them so ppp is think of ppp as asset purchase vehicle that they had created for pandemic it was for special purposes uh and then uh that tried coming down the markets a little bit but then it started working back again and as keith mentioned in today's call snb which is the swiss national bank stepped in now why does all this matter because this takes us to our next cross asset piece which is currencies we had some fairly substantial moves in currencies across the board so be it euro dollar be it uh, yen uh, be it the uh, uh, swiss francs uh, we had some very interesting moves on all of them and i didn't get to participate on the currencies except for i was long on uup calls and i ended up you know managing to sell all of them uh, based upon the extreme strength that ended up coming out i honestly had not expected uup to go where it went um i had uh, created a almost 2 and 1/2% of portfolio just with uup calls uh kind of worked out well um at this point of time um uh, what has not worked for me let's talk about that what has not worked for me is uh, i've been accumulating positions in merger up stocks such as uh, vmware such as uh, there have been couple of other ones uh, mandiant which google is buying uh, vmware is being bought by broadcom all of these are cash acquisition stocks uh, they are not uh, necessarily you know they are not like elon musk kind of uh, situation the buyers are credible they have done business in the past they have completed their uh, deals in the past uh, so from that standpoint uh, they definitely look that they'll close uh but what i got to know from the industry uh merger up industry is relatively small what i got to know was at least three pot shops collapsed uh their books uh, collapsed their lines on their merger up portion and that's what resulted into this widening of spread uh this is similar to what happened between march through may uh there were a bunch of uh, stocks where the spreads widened as much as 25% there was a company called annexta which was being purchased uh, at a, a close to $100 a share uh, it went down to as low as 72 so that's a 28% spread doesn't happen in merger up usually uh, there was another one called tall grass which was being bought by blackstone that was another 25 30% spread so similar to that um there's huge opportunities available at the moment if people want to take advantage of i have unfortunately maxed out on <laughs> all my major positions for my portfolio and they aren't working well uh but just want to share you know what's work well saas stocks and their shorts through put sports word put verticals and then uh, what has worked extremely well is uh, has uh, the international ones uh, what has not worked at all is the major up so with that i'll give it over what to you what, this is mike taylor again what are your favorite merger arbs just bang them out i'll take a look at them and i know the the merger arb genius at millennium oh He, awesome he's been there longer than i was so sure sure so the first one is activision blizzard uh for mike with microsoft uh second one is uh 
the one with uh, uh, Mandiant, MNDT, with Google. Uh, third one is VMware with uh, uh, AVGO, which is Broadcom. So these three are my top three. Got it. And what are the spreads? Yeah, I'd, no. Hey, Mike, I, I'd add Sale and MGI to those two, MoneyGram. And, uh, so MGI um, and Sale, like I'm going on a sailboat. Sail point, yeah. Sail S A I is the symbol, and Sail point is the name of the stock. Yeah. What are the yeah. spots at right now for all these names? Approximately, just ballpark. sure, sure. So ATVI ATVI is trading at around seventy five, and the deal is for ninety five. Uh, Mandiant is trading. Wow, at, wow, wow, wow! That's twenty bucks. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And then Mandiant is trading at around twenty one thirty, uh, while the deal is for twenty three. VMware is trading at one one five while while the deal that was is crazy. One, yeah, while the deal is at one forty two, and then sale point. I think the deal is at around sixty six. It's sixty five. It's sixty five twenty five. Sixty five okay, twenty five is 65. It's trading. It's trading at fifty nine fifty as of close, and then MGI uh, that deals at eleven is trading at nine sixty five or nine sixty four. Excuse me, as of uh, the close. Yeah. Thank so, you. Yeah, the some of these for the, the VMware, the VMware in particular. I mean, a, a little merge our basket like this is uh, it can it can be a great way to you know to if you got patience on your side to um, to, to make some money in a down market if you got to be long. Yeah, agreed. And uh, if you, you can juice it up with some options also, right? So if you do the yeah. right options trades, uh, call verticals or butterflies, you can literally juice it up for a 2x or 3x payout. Yeah, and for those listening, I'm just going to reiterate. I mean, Trent and I basically had a very similar basket because we like the same merger our plays, which are primarily all cash. Uh, so that, that VMware, I, can, I think it's VM's a combo. You can get cash and or choose to, to get shares as well. But basically, they, they've got it funded for, for both. Um, I believe it's VMware uh, that, that that's right. the scenario, but, but basically um, yeah, these are all, all cash deals, very uh, prevalent, you know, uh, a, a buyers, excuse me, is the word I'm looking for. And um, yeah, really, you know, basically it's just a matter of uh, uh, really time. Uh, the only one ATVI is really, I don't think there's much of a trend, correct me if I'm wrong, wrong but I don't think there's much of a, um, regulatory risk on the VMware, more of the ATVI, but that got kind of cleared up today on the call. Um, JT kind of spoke about it uh, with... Uh, Glencher, yeah. Glencher yeah. also. Yeah, so Glencher... Oh, brought, Glencher did too, okay. Yeah, Glencher gave a clarity that Microsoft has been working, you know, it's a magic trick uh, with Washington, D.C., especially, you know, when 97, 98 happened and Microsoft was taken down by the DOJ. Since then, Microsoft has uh, sowed the se- sown the seeds of uh, extreme diplomacy towards the administration. And uh, specifically for this deal, they are making sure that they are ma- uh, taking all the right steps. Even the CWA, which is a union, uh, they made sure that uh, the, the Workers' Alliance was completely... Uh, pacified and applicated and in fact now the union is saying that we do want this deal to go through so FTC may not have a case that's why the further out you go in options the more you have a risk reward kind of a setup for ATVI yeah Uh, the good news is that in ATVI uh, even Warren Buffett is on your side right so (laughs) that's true that's true he is playing it (laughs) yeah One one of a few things he's got in his portfolio right yeah yeah, so I have these uh, positions at my max stock uh, limit positions. Uh, they're not doing well at the moment, but uh, I'm uh, hoping that once the distress eases out or once we go to the other side, they'll all close just like the deals that closed after pandemic crash happened. Question, are any of you guys up on the year? Yes. Yes, I am. Yes, we are. Very good. Gavin is too. I know that. <laughs> so is, uh, Chris I think is a thousand effects you're like you're up to flat right but you have he's on mute Pretty hey sure I was up to flat. can, can I Go just ahead, ask a it. quick question Mike yeah. uh, I think a few weeks ago I think I caught a tweet saying that you were catching the turn in China and I just wanted to know are you still long or was that more of just like a short term trade for you uh, I am but I swapped um, in the past two days, I swapped about 
75% of it in calls. So, and that was really just the quad two that they can do, you know, they look, China can, China over the short term can do whatever it wants and it's opening back up. And so it'll be less horrible. And the stocks are already down like 70%, you know, so, so I'm, I'm there I, in part because I have to be long something. I, I don't want to be. But I have to be long something. So, uh, and so this way, uh, I only can lose a uh, hundred, one hundred fifty thousand dollars in premium rather than a uh, million dollars in uh, in stocks. So that's why that's how I set it up. But in there originally, I was multiple seven digits, uh, just long uh, China. Yeah, um, so you're saying quite two so did you because I was looking at um, basically the end of the quarter calls on on uh, like Epic Side today and K Web. Is that kind of what you did? Did you go or did you go out further? Just out of curiosity, Mike. Right now, I just did it really short to the end of next week. Oh, nice. <laughs> and 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 the, the reason the re yeah I put on like uh, yeah that kind of trade for a week, but uh, <laughs> one there, there's things that bother me. Yeah. And on China. And the big thing, I know you're going to be like, that's so convoluted, Taylor. What the hell? Mike, we're used to your stories. Larry Larry at Oracle does not like to lose. And he stepped off the board of Tesla. And I assume he's doing that so he's not restricting. He can dump his shares now. Of course, at the same day, they announced a three-for-one split, which was all planned, right? Keep the stock up while this guy's going to dump it because these guys are a bunch of scammers. But I was thinking as to, like, what the big problem is. And, yeah, Tesla's got problems. But what if Tesla knows that China is going to get more aggressive on Taiwan or whatever. Like he wants his money out right now. Look, this guy leaving the board from Tesla is a BFD, a big deal because it's free money. He's buds with this dude. They rule the world and now he's leaving. So he's leaving it because he needs to dump his shares. Why does he need to dump his shares right now? The guy's a multi, multi, multi billionaire. Why now? And leaving the board, it's not like he's just going to pop on the board some other day. Uh, this is a once-in-a-lifetime event. So the fact that he's ditching tells me something else is going on. And the only thing that I can think of is that something bad is going to happen in China. Because that's the only thing that will take Tesla down, 75%. So, so that's why I'm worried about K-Web. There's also a million other things, but that was the signal that I got in my head when I saw that news line. I was like, what is going on with China? So that makes sense. Cause if China was going to turn around really strong and Tesla is right back on, why is he leaving the board to dump his shares? And he, it's not an insignificant amount of shares he has either. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Huge. And, and the only reason you leave the board is because you're no longer an insider and you can dump the shares. That's the only reason he's leaving. So that 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 piqued my interest, and I moved K Web into calls because of it. I also tripled my Tesla position. Barry, I was just going to say. I mean, um, you know, <laughs> it's gone up six times since basically <laughs> in the last three and a half years, uh, from call it a round number of a hundred to six hundred. Um, yeah, so six, it's, like so it's like one billion so dollars. Yeah, he's he's made a shit ton of money. Twenty um, billion dollars, and now he can. Yeah. Dump- so yeah. it's not insignificant. This is like four percent of the company that he's going to dump. Right. Right. Interesting. Yeah. I. Uh, yeah. That. That. I like that. I like that. Uh, e plus B equals C. Um, AC, uh, you got a question? Can you hear me? Yes. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. First thing, um, Mike, are you going to be in Montreal for the F one? No. Ah, yeah. I'm going to miss you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We're racing. So we, we, we literally have like, I think we have, uh, (laughs) 
you're going to laugh. We have like uh, 18 weeks of racing in the back half of the year. So I, I used to do it too, so I know what it's like. Don't worry. Oh, you know what it's like. What did you race? Well, not karting, but GT, GT3s. GT3. Wow, that's awesome. Man, that, those were the days. That, that is, man, you know, it costs about a half million bucks a year, by the way. $5,000 an hour. Yep. So you are. You are your dad is broke, but I'm sure he's a rich man. <laughs> no, we had sponsors. We're good. We had sponsors. I'm working on it. Uh, so quick, probably not related to what you're speaking of, but as a fund manager right now, knowing what you know, how do you handle being just long in a fund? Well, I'm down one percent versus the benchmark this year, and that is now granted. That's still better than everyone else by a mile. But uh, one of the difficult things is in managing an all-long fund in this environment is that there are so few names that you can be in. And I'm in them. But I, that only can account for about 30% of the book just because of uh, sizing limitations. And so what I have to do is find other good ideas uh, that are out there. And right now in this environment, um, if you have a good idea, everyone's selling it because it's a good idea. And these are the disconnects that frequently don't last a long time, but in this environment do last a long time. So I am... Uh, constantly rejigging in order to find a way to outperform the benchmark. Now, typically I can outperform all my peers, uh, but um, the benchmark is even more, con- more concentrated than my book. And, and that's uh, one of the issues that, that there is in managing a vanilla, vanilla fund is the concentration limits. Meaning that if you look at the benchmark, there's about six names that are okay that really haven't gone down. And then all the rest are down 40, which makes those six names massively concentrated in the benchmark. So nobody can actually run their fund the way the benchmark looks right now. So in those instances, it's very hard to outperform the benchmark. And now, uh, I'm pretty confident that I will um, because there will be moments where I can rejigger, but that is one of the most difficult things in running of an elephant. And, um, and, and you just, sometimes you have to take some pain. Fortunately for me, the pain is a couple hundred basis points. That's like 2%. Uh, and in my case, 1%. Um, but, but I'm willing to do that to get sized and extremely good ideas that are being thrown out baby with the bathwater. And that's what's happening now. The baby is going out with the bathwater. And this is really exciting for me because it's putting up uh, opportunities. So like somebody like you and your fund, I'm forgive me. I haven't read your mandate. Are you like holding all inflows in cash in case there's like a liquid liquidation event? Like is that something you do? No. No. It's, I mean, we don't have to, I don't have to worry about that because I'm, uh, everything I'm in is so liquid. And, uh, and, and I, I also think that I am the largest shareholder in the fund. So I respect that. Yes. (laughs) So so I'm not selling. (laughs) So I'm buying. And so, um, so I'll be, I will be. I will be very likely uh, larger rather than smaller uh, throughout the year. Um, All right, Mike. So, Thanks a lot. So not, Appreciate it. We're liquid enough where we don't have that problem. Like Kathy Woods has that problem because her friend owns over 10% of a zillion of her companies, which right. is incredibly irresponsible. But whereas my fund in these companies, it's sub, sub, sub 0.1%. So really, <laughs> all very liquid so we don't have to worry about that all right thanks a lot mike appreciate it and uh hope your son keeps killing it thank you cheers
All right, so uh, Gavin, I think you may be in the car, but what's uh, what was pop- what's been popping off this week in in, in your in, in your notebook, or, or kind of what's shifted in your mind from say uh, the beginning of the week to uh, where we are today, post FOMC going into OPEX tomorrow, and obviously a uh, long weekend. So just kind of curious, Gavin, as to uh, what 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 you're uh, what you're seeing out there, buddy. Yeah, man, I, I'm about to hop because my my oldest got invited f- to a summer league for baseball, so we're right back into baseball. I'm hopping into a practice with them, but uh, nice. yeah, Enjoy. yeah, yeah. But no, there's there's really not much, man. I'm 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 not doing anything sexy with these merger arms like you guys. I love hearing about it, but it's just heavy cash. Um, the one, just one, like interesting call out that's not gonna you know, it'd be like uh, anything like too crazy, but it's just, I know a lot of people are thinking about the U S dollar obviously and gold. And I think I tweeted it earlier this week, but for the entire year, the trending correlation between gold and the dollar has been positive. And in early May, or I'm sorry, late May, it actually is now the trending correlation is negative the inverse. And so as we're thinking about, you know, if you're holding dollars and you're also looking at gold here, um, just to, to realize where your risk is every day, you know. And so that's just a call out I wanted to uh, and we'll see how it develops. But it looks like it's kind of intact and moving that way. So I thought that was interesting. I think I talked about uh, uh, the simplify. We're talking about simplify. Right. So P fix. Uh, that was good from last week, uh, just to deal with this uh, treasury, you know, the, the fixed in- income volatility, um, you know, so that that was a performer this week. I had to I had to deal with natural gas. I came I was uh, half size long uh, from a while back into that down that down tape yesterday. And so uh, I had room. And so I bought pretty well near the, the, the low of the day and then I bailed on the whole thing today so i'm no longer uh long that and i have about a third of my long uh crude position still on and i'm just kind of you know i think last week i was saying like i'm looking to, to sell it pretty soon so i i started selling it and have a little bit hanging on in, in commodities but um mostly just heavy cash man and, and just kind of riding this out i mean the way it looks to me like if if stocks don't bounce here um, it's like, <laughs> I, I mean, it's, it's just, uh, it's just like, I'm not seeing this kind of, uh, extension down, you know, and when I'm looking back at all, all, all the models that I have in Excel, uh, and I'm just looking at it like, wow, they, they really should in the next few weeks, but, uh, you know, we'll just see. So I, I'm just kind of waiting to see. It happened in 2008 and nine. What it just kept going? It just kept going. It yeah. was every, every day. Just well, wait, one, one, wait. I, remember the Fed actually worked hard to hold up stocks the whole time. Correct. And they did. They did. Because I ran a book then. That was a, that was the hardest year because I didn't know half third. And and the most painful uh outcome. Um, was was that the Fed held my shorts the whole time, and and they didn't break until September. Correct. September, they kept just going down, down, down in a very quick three weeks, if I remember correctly. Yeah, well, then, but the Fed held it up because they kept lower rate. Everyone yep. figured this turn was right around the corner, soft landing, soft landing, right around the corner. I can't tell you how many times they said soft landing. Oh, I agree. The reverse. We have a collapse in margins, credit's going wild, and we are aggressively tightening. And that is, that is unprecedented for stocks. Yeah, and credit hasn't even snapped like it should. Well, you'll see it when margins blow up. Agreed. Not this quarter. That's when everyone worries when margins blow up. Yeah, I agree, Mike. So but you're saying there's a chance? There's a chance. <laughs> there's a ch- there's a chance to hold on for a little bit, but but I've seen it happen. Mike's seen it happen. If you've been through 0809, you know they they kept you know as, as Keith always talks about the shark line. They kept bringing it back up to the shark line, and then you know just boom, fail, 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 and then all of a sudden you just had collapse, collapse, collapse. So Mike's 100 percent right. You go back through like 
you know, February, April through June, July, you have those shark lines, shark lines. Once September came, it was just boom. It was fast. Yeah. But it felt like what it felt like was just for that time period that Mike's talking about, it was just every day. It was just boom, boom, boom. And if you couldn't short, if you weren't short and you weren't in a lot of cash, you felt a lot of pain. So that's it for me, Robert. Um, Awesome, man. I'm going to catch you guys later. Sorry, I have to leave early. Go enjoy some uh, go enjoy some baseball, bud. Some good practice. Congrats to congrats to the boy for making the summer league. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be fun. So, all right, yeah. I'll catch you guys later. Hi, right, buddy. Sounds good. Right. Sounds good. Yeah. So, uh, Jeremy, I do see your hand out there, and uh, Bexley was kind enough to come on. So he's uh, he's an options uh, guru. So we'd love to get kind of see what he's uh, what he's seeing going into OpEx tomorrow. But just in terms of some things that are jumping off of the page to me. Um, you know, the, the commodity space in particular, I think, is uh, of the utmost importance right now. I mean, you're hearing it out of coach almost every day. You know, disinflation is, the, is, is what's on the horizon, you know, to, to what degree, right? And so balancing your book accordingly, I think, is really important. Um, you know, silver in particular, I think, uh, is probably a, a, good, good, um, uh, a good one to have on, on on the other side of gold. So just to kind of piggyback off of Gavin's uh, commentary there. You, know, you got gold in the PA. Um, I know Coach is taking his positions down uh, across both fixed income and 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 gold in particular. But uh, but yeah, but I think kind of shorn it up a little bit, having having a bit if you can, you know, get a little bit, um, uh, you know, go get get kind of short the the silver. Uh, I think that's setting up kind of nicely here as well. And then <clears throat> beyond that, uh, you know, not a, a lot of places you can hide. You know, that's kind of the theme theme today. Uh, but China certainly, you know, is looking better. You know, Mike, uh, Mike TV already kind of addressed that, but do want to just reiterate um, the, the fact that, that China is definitely a place to, uh, you know, it's a good quad outlook, good economic kind of outlook if things go according to plan. Now, again, if they, uh, if, if, if uh, shit hits the fan in terms of, you know, invading uh, Taiwan or, or kind of participating with Russia, you know, that's going to be a whole nother ball game, but um you know, we'll just kind of stick to the signals, and the signals right now uh, look very good. There aren't a whole lot that are, are bullish on the screen, uh, certainly in kind of core ETFs, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll name the ones that are right now. So you got oil, uh, the dollar, um, you know, uh, Golden Dragon, so PGJ, uh, PFIX still looks great and is a, is a great, uh, uh, great way to express some fixed income there, and it's acting exactly the way it should. Um, K Web, uh, soybean still still kind of bullish. Uh, same with coffee and natty gas, right? So uh, natty gas is definitely uh, teetering again. I'm talking about the ETFs itself, so UNG, not the underlying uh, commodity itself. But uh, yeah, natty's uh, natty's kind of teetering on on trend in, in my in and on 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 the model uh, that kind of stuff. But uh, so yes, yeah, so be careful with with natty. But uh, those are definitely. Some of the ones that um, that that look still that that again that, that are still kind of bullish trend and and looking okay. So um, otherwise, it's uh, you got a low end of the risk range. Just remember, volatility will drive uh, that lower lower end of the risk range and can keep pressing it lower, right? So you saw that in the updated risk range from Coach in one of the RTAs today. Um, you know that's really driven off of a thirty six to thirty eight top end of the VIX, and that's what's going to drive that that low end going into. Uh, you know, call it 3550 range. Um, so again, just uh, keep that in mind. Um, these risk ranges are wide. The volatility is, and, and the vol of vol, you know, so VVIX is a great way. If you aren't familiar with it, you can pull it up on TradingView, which is VVIX. Um, it's a great kind of common man way of kind of understanding the vol of vol. I tweeted about this yesterday. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's certainly, gaining some near-term traction it's it's uh didn't quite put in a one month high today but it's likely going to do so here soon so just keep an eye on that that definitely means volatility is trending in the wrong direction uh but i do see professor plum out there aka michael green it's always a pleasure to have you on uh, i i, I pin this to the tweet deck to the tweet nest excuse me and you know you've got some passive flows coming so just keep that in mind as well opex is tomorrow uh, those passive flows for month end typically kind of start next, uh, call it the 23rd, give or take. 
uh, and his quarter end as well. So just kind of keep that in mind in the near term, and um, and then you know watch out for earnings coming in in in, uh, in the first first bit of Q3. But um, with that, I'm going to kind of pass off to Vexley. Vexley, it's a pleasure to have you on. I know you're in the UK; it's late there. Um, but uh, you know, curious kind of what you're seeing in the options market. I mean, it was pretty. <laughs> I don't want to be like wacky, but it was uh, there were some interesting things going on. A lot of a lot of dollars flowing around. Um, I, I, I in particular, I was speaking with with Chris earlier, and we were like, okay, well, if 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 they put twenty percent down, you know, if they were looking at you know the market going down twenty percent, you know, those options were basically there right now. I'll call it you know uh, you know uh, thirty nine hundred, I think it was, is that actual number, and then um, or, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, and then or thirty six nine. Anyway, but uh, twenty twenty percent down from here is basically two ninety or twenty nine hundred, and uh, and and those got. I mean that the volume and the open interest on those were, were crazy. So so Vex, I'll uh, I'll pass it off to you if you don't mind. You can kind of maybe run through what what you what you uh, were seeing out there today, and and maybe how you're positioned going into uh, the next few days. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> going into today um was a bit of a mix of just thinking about how we reacted post FOMC last last rate hike even though we kind of like met expectation it's like you had like the the first move like being the the flows sort of move like the structural flows like impacting price and like when you get like a binary event like naturally you get a lot more puts like jumping in and you kind of saw that with like VIX basically like crushing post the announcement um so that that like gave like supportive flows to to the market like with with like the varna effect and then like the charm effect for all those like near dated options right so then you end up with like a, a bit of a high but then like once that's kind of like faded off um you had like this like intense kind of sell and and a lot of that is also like due to the fact that there were a bunch of calls like present so like on our like models that we track like charm varna gamma kind of dynamically throughout the day and uh yeah that just like completely flipped so charm was super positive um i mean like it's an assumption that i i basically create so that we can like clear out the view of like okay where's the driving force coming from like is it coming from calls if it's calls and it will just be negative and if it's if it's puts we like flip it over and then make make that like a, a positive so you can get a view of that because I mean, like puts expiring, since you're going to be a positive buying force, right? Um, so yeah, we saw we saw a bunch of that. And then when we like rerun it, like sort of around like Asia op- open, um, you could see that there was like a, a difference again. So that like basically completely flipped, and then you just got this intense sell. But what was super interesting, and like something that we've been like consistently tracking, like working to like visualize, make it easier for other people to see, because up right now it's like a bit of a a beta stage kind of thing um there's like a lot of peak positions like popping up um on like the gamma side of things right and like every time these peak positions like present themselves like particularly like the highest gamma notional kind of strike um as long as it kind of persists even with price kind of moving in the opposite direction which we've had a bit of right and it sort of referring to like that staggered sell kind of comment i made a little while back um if they persist so like 370 was this persistent strike this time around and prior to that it was like 390 410 400 and so on um i just find that the price just naturally like gravitates toward it and we like we landed 370 right um so now like the next strike that's steadily appearing slash has started to today post that breakdown of that level is 350 um i'm not saying that we're going to land there but um i think like at the moment so like one of the bots that we've kind of got running uh like identified like there's like a fair bit of charm due to expire today, like on spy as an example. So like near dated is around like 30 billion just on spy um, for those flows. And like that would give us like a bit of a bounce, which it did like pre pre close um, kind of expect that to give like a bit of follow through going into 
the Asia Open or Globex Open, and then maybe you see like more of the same again once that kind of expires. So I'm I'm just going to keep tracking this this peak positioning because if if I'm seeing that like maintain itself, then uh, I have a feeling that we we do drift down lower and hit the 350, which kind of falls in line with like the last rate hike, even though we kind of like met, met the sort of expected value of, of the hike. Like we were still down around 10% post post hike, right? Yeah, absolutely. No, good, great call outs. Um, always a pleasure to have you on, man. And uh, so Trader Tony, I think you came on, was that around the kind of what Vex was just talking about or did you have another commentary, comment, question? I'm, I'm sorry, I do have something to say. I'm just in uh, You can pass on, be right back. I do have something great to say about Vexley and the gamma exposure and an experience today. If you just brilliant, me brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll come back to you. Okay, perfect. Yeah, awesome, man. Thanks, Tony. Thank thanks, you. Tony. All right, J- Jeremy, thanks for, uh, thanks for uh, being patient, man. But uh, the floor is yours and welcome. Sure. Um, yeah, thanks for um, inviting me out, fellas. Um, I just had a quick question. You know, I saw the 10 year today hit a high of 3.5%, closed around 3.2. Um, I think Mike Taylor, you know, mentioned the potential possibility of the Japanese bidding it end of day, you know, maybe front running their policy de- uh, decision tonight. Um, I kind of read it as, you know, maybe this recessionary trade uh, with the back end coming in a bit. But, you know, I'd just love to hear his thought process on, you know, what he's seeing there. I'm sorry, what did you mean? Um, you mentioned, you know, the possible notion of the Japanese. You, you said the Japanese were maybe bidding the 10-year end of day. You know, that's why we saw uh, it. Kind yeah. of- so it's basically a vote of no confidence. And what we haven't seen yet uh, to a degree is the Japanese public, who is a very large investor in Japanese assets, to uh, exit and start buying foreign assets to escape their currency crunch. And it, look, the central bank is in an incredible pickle because of modern monetary theory um, and, and, a, and a negative sort of growing population. They essentially have pumped in cash in order to keep the value of assets up. And the reason why they did that is because of the population cratering. There's more drawing on all of the pension funds than there are people adding to it. So if that were the case to let it ride, all assets in Japan would crater every year because of essentially a negative imbalance in demand. And they wanted to avoid that or else all the pension funds blow up. This is, by the way, all the stuff that you can't read because it's never been written. So you just have to look at the math to understand what's going on and why they're doing what they're doing. And so they just lied to everybody and said it's because of our uh, goals. But the, the real reason is, is it's because everyone would end up selling the JGBs because of uh, pension uh, negative flows and uh, interest rates would explode and then they couldn't finance the government. So they've engaged in, uh, you know, wily nonsense uh, forever money printing. And now they're at the point where it costs something and you're seeing it in the collapse of the currency. I mean, you're essentially seeing 20 years of uh, fiscal malfeasance all coming to a head at once. And it's probably more than 20 years because you really have to include 1990 uh, in their their equity bubble to account for that. So it's closer to 30 plus years of this. Um so, so anyway, that's what we might be seeing. And eventually someone will knock sense into some of these Japanese uh, investors' heads. You can't be in Japanese the JGB or JPY denominated assets. And that's what I'm thinking might, we might be seeing the start up. Now, if it does go that way, Japan will institute capital controls to keep uh, the entire public hostage. So there's going to be a lot of legs or shoes to drop. So just keep an eye on what they say. I think it's going to be more of a song and dance, uh, but I am really curious in what the ramifications are. Yeah, and um, 
uh, so, uh, or my good friend Brian uh, just came on. He's uh, he's very intimate with the uh, Muni bond market. So I might uh, pass the mic over to him. He, I I shared one of his uh, tweets in the nest as well, just in terms of uh, what rates look like today versus earlier this year, that kind of stuff to give everybody some um, some direction in terms of where they've been and, and where they are. But uh, yeah, Brian, welcome. Thanks for coming up, man. Hey, thanks for having me, Robert. Um, just a, a shout out to a couple of folks that um, I message with, but we don't get to talk very often. Uh, trend. Uh, thanks for all your uh, insight, what you send me. I'm sorry that I'm not smart enough to understand it, but I am definitely uh, trying to learn. Uh, and Mitchell, uh, appreciate um, our conversations back and forth. And then last but not least, uh, thanks to Mike Taylor. The uh, the May 18th um, notebook, What is the Bottom, is me. I'm one that uh, took all those notes and kind of packaged it so I would have a roadmap that I would not steer away from as I waited for Nirvana to, uh, to present itself. So I know that's been retweeted around, um, a bunch, but, um, <clears throat> to, uh, to the muni space. So, uh, my own and operated municipal advisor firm and we're in the primary market a lot. And then I purchase, uh, for my own PA, uh, individual bonds, very conservative. I pretty much stick to, to education and utilities. I don't really get outside of, um, that stay away from healthcare turnpikes, you know, all the, all the bullshit. Um, but I posted up, uh, the, uh, MMD rate. So for those of you that don't know what that is, um, every day and my firm subscribes to it. Um, Thompson's Reuters puts out a municipal bond scale called the municipal market data. We just call it the MMD and it's supposed to represent the scale for a triple A rated geo bond with a 5% coupon. And so that's like your benchmark to start from. And then your weaker credits spread differently from there. Uh, and then your couponing will change your, your yield, of course, um, 3% coupon fours or fives. So um, I put up uh, in um, Robert's post, just a chart that kind of gives everybody an idea of what municipalities are facing in terms of higher interest rates. Um, it starts off with the beginning of the year. Uh, you know, the one year rate was 0.17. Uh, feels like that's very, <laughs> it's not very long ago, but that's what we had for a long time. And, you know, the, t the yield in 25 years was point, I'm sorry, 1.45. Um, <clears throat> we then, you know, we then uh, uh, saw a sell off in, in rates and we peaked on May 18th. And so what I did is showed a comparison of the January 3rd beginning of the year to the peak in yields on May 18th. And I actually purchased a bunch of bonds for my PA on the 18th and 19th. But you can see that the, the change in, in rates is substantial for, uh, for, for governments to finance. And then we started to rally from there for two weeks. And we had a, a meaningful rally of about 60 basis points. Um, but that's over. So as of today at four o'clock, I got the new scale and we're plus 60. So, you know, the, the yield in 25 years is essentially back to the equivalent yield on, uh, on May 18th. So um, it's ugly. Uh, it's really, really ugly in the muni space. Um, I sent a, a request for a scale over to Piper Sandler to their desk um, double A rated credit. Um, and they wrote me back and said that, uh, their day to day on deals right now, uh, cannot give me a scale, um, quote until the selling ends. And so they're, they just really can't price, um, bonds right now and bonds are going day to day. Um, I did ask for some color on some of the couponing and the response on me wanting 5% coupons so I could refinance, you know, at the 10 year mark a little bit more, um, the higher degree of probability was that mutual funds were out of money and that, um, they can't place 5% coupons after 15 years. Um, uh, I'm 50 years old. I've been doing this for, you know, a little more than 20 years. I've never had that comment before. There just literally is, you know, mutual funds are, are just out of money. So, you know, from an issuer perspective, uh, things are pretty um, dicey right now. But if, uh, you know, if you if you want to branch out into the municipal bond space, you know, you can you can get yields that you have not been able to see. Um, I cannot recall 
when I was able to buy a bond for four and a half, five percent, um, triple tax free in, 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 in any, any memory that I have now, you know, will it go higher? I don't, you know, I don't know. Uh, I don't think anybody knows, but you know, 5% yield or four and a half percent yield taxable equivalent. Um, you know, you, everyone's got different tax rates you know, you're talking about locking in, you know, in, around an 8% return, um, on a taxable account. And, uh, you know, municipal bonds have a, a very low, um, default rate as long as you stay within the right categories. Um, the only other, uh, piece of color, um, that I can add, well, I should say, um, on the other move I made this week was I had some ETFs in some bonds that I, um, just carried for a while. I probably should have cut them. I had losses in them. So I, I, took the losses to just create the losses and I'm moving into buying individual names as opposed to the ETFs. So, um, I found out after last year, uh, when my CPA did my taxes that I ran out of losses from carry forward. So sometimes creating lo new losses, you know, can create an opportunity down the road for, um, you on the tax planning side. But the only other weird thing that I noticed today, um, that I wanted to share with the group was, um, um I trade on fidelity they put out um, updated three-month CD rates, and there was uh, one bank that put up um, a sizable block at 2%. And um, I got busy, and I refreshed my screen in an hour, and they were all gone, the whole, the whole block. So, um, you know, I don't know what that means. Um, I think it means probably something a little bit different for everybody, but... Um, you know, the idea that a lot of people went into equities to get yield during COVID when there was no yield um, as this unwinds, you know, there's probably a lot of people that, um, you know, find fixed income attractive again and probably won't return to the equity markets. So um, with that, Robert, that's all I've got to share. That's awesome. I think we may we may have a couple of questions for you, Brian. Oh, OK. Uh, George came up. George came up. So did Jeff uh, Jeff skill. Um, and you know, I'll just make a, a quick comment. Uh, podcast is not sponsored by Simplify, but Simplify has a great ETF uh, that helps manage tail risk. It's called CYA, like cover your ass. It's one. Uh, it's one of my f first of all favorite <laughs> ETF takers because it's a, a very uh, fortuitous name uh, for what it's supposed to do, and it's been functioning exactly the way it, it uh, it's designed. So, if you're not familiar uh, with it, uh, CYA and or uh, tail, but uh, since we got the uh, you know co-founder Simplify on here listening in, we'll just uh, forget I mentioned tail, and we'll just go with CYA. Um, <laughs> but uh, George, uh, floor's yours. Uh, yeah, George, floor's yours, man. Now I just want to ask a question. Hi, hi guys, thanks. Uh, okay. Thanks for putting that CYA on my radar. I, just, I didn't know about that one. Um, yeah. Brian, right? Uh, I just had a quick question. See, Michael, he, maybe we got to sponsor the podcast, but uh, anyway. <laughs> All right, George. Sorry, man. Uh, Brian, was, Brian, you're saying that that you, you tried to take an issue, and they weren't bidding. Uh, Piper wasn't bidding on, on on a particular issue, or were you trying to unload it? What, what was going on there? Is it, and is that is that because that like because I don't know anything about the muni market, but just on in regular credit markets, if 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 you know if trading desks aren't bidding on on stuff or just take me through that a little bit i just want to know sure. how sure. how how is it like relative to historical because is is this is this the beginning of cracks or that we're that you're starting to see in the muni market um just can you just walk me through that sure um so definitely we we are in a period of uh of cracks whether or not they come back together or not we'll see that we had cracks on may 18th so um in my chart, I, I show the MMD and and I show it rallying pretty hard. So I, you know, I we got a lot of deals done, um, you know, very fluidly uh, during that period. And then all of a sudden, we find ourselves where we are today. So um, as you prepare a bond issue to bring to market, um, you know, you you want to uh, have estimates in the prospectus or the offering document that's reflective of current market. And so you request from the underwriter that you're working with for a um, preliminary scale. And um, it's usually just a, um, it's a, it's a nothing burger event, right? It's, it's, they just put a scale together and look at different uh, comps and they'll send you about three comps and they'll send you uh, a scale and say, this is where we think uh, this, this piece of paper comes. And you go back and forth a little bit on some, uh, you know, some small tweaks, but, 
It's really a simple process. But you, what you don't get is you don't get, I can't give you a scale because I don't know where the market is. That's not an answer that is normal. Um, it's not to say that there won't, the market in the muni space won't find footing. Um, I would be surprised if it didn't find footing. But, um, you know, we're in a, a, a period where deals this week went on what's called day to day, where they just wanted to see if the market firm, no, market firm, no, market firm, no. You price Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays normally. And uh, so no deals are priced tomorrow. And they all decided to push to next week. Uh, from the underwriter's perspective, you know, once they take a deal to market and they try to sell the bonds, if they don't sell enough of the bonds, then it's really kind of customary for them to give you an offer to underwrite and they go along and take risk. And so they don't really want to be in that position in this type of a market where they have to take that uh, type of risk because things are just, you know, the, if you think of like the ocean, the, the waters are just not calm enough to, uh, to do that. So they were unable to provide me a scale because they did not know where price was. They were in a, a, a process of reestablishing price discovery. And um, we will see what happens uh, next week. But um, I'm going to try and, and be a little more diligent about updating this chart that I produced and then um, putting it on Robert's tweet so that people can see the um, MMD scale that you have to subscribe to get. So you don't really get to see it unless you subscribe to it. And uh, you all can look at it and, and see the differences and the changes and the, appreciate, you know, what that what this market's doing. Right. I hope that is, helps. Is, 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 there, is there an index or an ETF that tracks spreads uh, for munis like across the board that, that we could kind of get a, a glimpse of, okay, th this is starting to crack and some like, like an IG's, like, you know how we track I, IG CDS spreads and stuff like that. Um, is there something for the muni market? Cause I, I don't know anything about muni. So not that I know of, okay. um, you know, most ETFs, they uh, either they're open or closed and they, 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 they're closed, you know, they have, they have a certain amount of money and they just buy bonds and they manage their portfolio. If they're open, then they, they may have redemptions and they have to sell. Um, so there's some forced selling. And then on the same side, forced buying when there's a lot of inflows. So mm -hmm. it's, it's not as if you can just look at that and, and know where, where yields are. The mm -hmm. other thing is, is, is there's a difference. When you buy an ETF, you're buying a blended portfolio of bonds that are maturing in one year, two years, five years, 10, 15, 20 you know, so you got to average them or weight them. When you buy individual names, which most people don't do, you know, you're buying a, a specific rate on the yield curve. So like, what am I doing today? I'm buying one year rates and I'm buying 25 year rates. And what I, what I personally want is on the 25 year rate is for a high coupon because at the 10 year mark, it's the probability of them refinancing me out is pretty high. Mm -hmm. as opposed to buying the, say, 15-year rate and then the same thing happening in, at, in 10 years. I get, I get um, uh, prepaid, but I have a lower yield at you know, 15 years than 25. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you know, buying individual names is, a, is something that I think people in the markets have moved away from um, over time. But um, I think once people start to understand it again and get re um, invested in owning individual names as opposed to an ETF, um, people will, will appreciate the um, you know the flexibility and added advantage of of going that route. Yeah. I, All right. Cool. I, Thanks. I think one of the reasons why people got away from buying individuals as opposed to or buying ETFs as opposed to individuals is because typically you'd you'd be bidding you know ten twenty five bonds a clip you know there used to be minimums at the firm that i would work at 20 you know 25 26 years ago when i started i 26 years i did munis for a good 10 specializing in in them and bank stocks i can't remember a time in my career doing that where a deal ever came back like that as well so i mean if you want if you want cracks i think that's cracks yeah, that's a good point. So um, when we do negotiated deals, uh, there's a, what we call the priority of orders. And so uh, retail gets um, the top priority. Uh, so if you're, say, with Fidelity, um, you can go on their fixed income section. There'll be a new issuance section and you can actually place 
um, a, a pre-market order for a bond issue that they're involved with. And if you do that and, um, you know, they go through the allocations after the, um, the order period, then you are number one in line to get filled versus say state farm. Um, but I think the, the technology has advanced enough to where people can buy individual names easier and more clean today than maybe they were 10 years ago. That's good news. Yeah. X2 is listening in uh, too. And I know he shared with the other side and I over the last few days, just that the mortgage, I mean, he, he, he also is tied into the credit markets from, from prior roles and um, basically the, the credit that's just, uh, I mean, I'm, so gen- I'm massively generalizing here, so please take this with a grain of salt, but they've gone no bid, uh, and, and it's, uh, it's not a good environment. And, and Brian, you're just basically echoing that in, in, a, different, um, in, in a different arena, a.k.a. the muni space. But, Are you talking um, about mortgage? You're talking about yeah, mor- mortgage, 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 mortgage backs? Yeah, the mor- mortgage backs, exactly, MBS. Okay. Yeah. Now, in full uh, disclosure. George, George, do you have a Bloomy, though, buddy? Because you should be able to pull up those muni spreads on a Bloomy if you have it. Yeah, not uh, only at the office, and I'm not at home. Yeah, yeah, fair. Okay, um, yeah, I don't have my. So yeah, so if you can, if if you can, um, if you get actually, you should be able to have them on. on um, again, I don't have a Bloomy anymore, but um, uh, I'm sure somebody here does. So if somebody who has a Bloomberg, if they want to tweet at me or put it in the nest, how you could look up the muni spreads, um, please do so because I'm sure that it's I'm sure they're there. Be Val. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> there you yeah, go. You can, Look at this. You can I'm put solving, in a Q-tip I'm solving and just, world uh, problems type in right here. Uh, sorry, Matt. Go ahead, man. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, it's you B- put in a, whatever QCIP, Muni, uh, DES Go, and then on the description page, just type in BVAL, and it'll give you the Bloomberg equivalent of MMD. And then, right. so, like, for partic- particular issuers, like, you can, you can, like, go back and look how that B Val has has moved and it, it'll give you the credit spread as well as the like the credit spread over bval bval being the bloomberg's trying to make their like uh risk-free scale but i cool. I, I wanted to yeah, go ahead Matt. on yeah. the on the media market in particular and why i think we're definitely seeing cracks uh in this system which has larger implications for you know, municipalities to issue and get access to the capital markets. So the first thing that happened really is you go back to March and April of 2020. And like, obviously like COVID, COVID initially hit, the markets went through this massive liquidity crisis. And you see, you see SIFMA, you see the front end blow out six, 700 basis points. Like, and then, and then you had ratios upwards of two, three hundred, four hundred percent, and all the ratio is is it's that tax-free rate to a taxable rate. So as the ratio goes up, like you're getting more yield equivalent than a taxable. So like, you just got crazy cheap. The problem, the problem with this is a lot of dealer desks were super long and then lost a mega shit ton of money. So some of the top five dealers lost upwards of hundreds of millions of dollars. And so because of that, they and it's a long only product, so you can't run like a DDO one neutral book like you can like in corporates or other products. So a lot of dealers really scaled back uh, what they're doing as far as inventory. And for lack of better words, almost took on a hedge fund mentality where they would buy things to help make a market, but really like if they're buying things for principal position, they're going to hold on to them for as long as they can, thinking like a general market direction if the market's going to rally. So what you have is you are taking less risk. And then with uh, zero interest rate policy enacted by the Fed and everything that they did, everyone was searching for yield. And as the speaker pointed out earlier, once you go from fives to fours, there's usually a 25 to 30 basis point spread. Well, that compressed down to like 15. So people went from four to 3% coupons. And then that spread compressed down from typically 30 to 20. And then people, large insurance uh, portfolios, large bank portfolios, because they need like super high quality assets on their book, started uh, going down to 
two and seven eighths, two and three quarters, two and a half, two percent coupons. The problem now is all those bonds, not only did the spreads blow back out, but just if you're on a unhedged, uh, running an unhedged book, like those interest rates just blew out completely and there's no home for those. And, and then the last thing I'll say is as far as like mutual fund flows and, and all that, the problem is, is most municipal bonds have a 10 year park all, which brings their duration right around 10, like eight to 10 years, depending. And all of a sudden, all these calls were out of the money. And so once they're out of the money, the duration risk really accelerated for a lot of these funds. So now they're four sellers of threes, fours, and they're all trying to buy fives. And so like, while at the same time that interest rates are going up and they're taking on massive losses, and now they just have massive outflows. And so, yeah, to the earlier speaker's point, like there's not a really good buyer out there. I mean, the hedge funds are dipping in and dipping out, but like they're not backstopping anything because they think it's all going lower because obviously what the Fed is doing. And then you've got dealer desks who are not willing to commit serious capital. I couldn't agree uh, more, Matt, with what you're saying. Um, the only additional color that I would say is, um, and it was a little more opportunistic, is that during COVID, you have a lot of these uh, ETFs that they run on leverage. And so they you know, they take a uh, portion of their assets and they, uh, they'll they sell SIFMA-backed or SIFMA-priced warrants. And so when CIF, the SIFMA market froze, everything went upside down for them forced liquidations, their price, their NAVs just plummeted and um, you could kind of scoop them up for a, a short period of time. And well, then that, of course, that, and then the Fed came in, right, and saved the SIFMA market and everything yeah. went back to normal. This time around, if we have that same event, will the Fed be there, right? And and um, I don't know. You know, I think it's uh, it's good to understand. And I know that this notebook review call is to try to find opportunities. Um and I think right now we're at a point where I think the true opportunity for a retail investor in the municipal space that's looking for buy, looking to buy bonds is to buy individual bonds um, that are being priced now that have coupons that are, you know, four to fives. And like you said, Matt, stay away from buying bonds in the secondary market at twos and threes. Um, you know, that will take you the full duration cycle. Well, I, I mean, I would also recommend trying to get in on the, in the primary market. The problem yes. in the yeah. secondary market is like you'll you'll buy from a hedge fund, like, you know, a dealer desk will buy from a hedge fund who then sell to a financial advisor who then sell to you. And it's getting marked up three or four different times before it ends up in your hands. But, yeah, the, the TOB unwind during COVID was a, was a big problem, too. Yeah. Now, anyone who wants to learn about how to buy municipal bonds. Um, so the MSRB, the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board, the MSRB has their own website and they put together a platform called Emma and it was really put together for the retail investor. So you can go on Emma, type in a QSIP and see how all the trades behind the QSIP. Um, you can look up an issuer, see all the debt that they have. You can see their audits. But they also have a lot of learning tools about how bonds are priced and sold in the primary market. And it's geared towards ensuring that the retail investor has a fair chance at buying bonds at the initial offering price, not the price that Matt was just referring to, which is bonds that have been traded you know, two to three times before they find a home in a mom and pop shop. But you have to do the research and, and go do the education. Um, MSRB, Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board, and they have um, a series of uh, learning learning tools that you can learn how these bonds are priced and made available to you. Robert, any other questions for me? Otherwise, I got awesome. we're having a pool yeah, party can, tonight. Apparently, yeah. <laughs> amazing. Uh, I think Jeff did come on. Uh, Jeff okay. Skill something. If you don't, if you can give him maybe five more minutes, and then yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, Jeff, did you have commentary? Yeah, on thanks, the Bonds. Yeah, yeah, buddy. Yeah, yeah thanks, thanks a lot, Brian. I really appreciate and, and Brian, for a question. We, we we've intrigued Nancy Davis too, man. So this is uh, this is kind of taking on a whole fixed income life of its own. <laughs> quad four, baby, right? Quad, quad four. four, baby. Uh, Jeff, <laughs> yeah, I, I'll, I just I'll shut up and then pass it over to you, man. 
Yeah, I, I just um, I stumbled into this this space, and I, I really appreciate all the information. I'm, I'm kind of a novice when it comes to bonds. Um, but you said something earlier about mutual funds being out of money. What what was the context of that? Um, I, I didn't I didn't really follow what what that implication was. And then kind of a follow up question is, if if you were to see the market stable, what would that look like? And then if you if you think that that you know there's another shoe that's going to drop, what would that look like? Kind of where, you know, where, where should we look for, for kind of the, the, um, the, the cracks to emerge, um, you know, things are going to, if things are going to worsen. Um, okay. Well, first, uh, the question on, um, well, go ahead and re- what was the first part again? Yeah. You mentioned uh, the mutual earlier, funds, uh, mutual funds. Yeah, so, funds um, out of money. Right? yeah. So when we price bonds in the, mis- in the primary market, um, the color that I'm getting right now is that maturities that are 16 years, which would be 2038 and beyond that normally we always could take a block of 5 million, 10 million and dump it to a mutual fund at a five coupon. That's not available to us. They don't, they don't have cash to be that buyer. Um, the, uh, let's see if I still have the, um, the email that I received back. Um, the email that I received back says, I ran 4% coupons out long because the mutual funds are out of money. It's very difficult selling fives beyond, five coupons beyond 15 years. So that was the comment from uh, the email I received back from the underwriter. What's so the implication of that? We have to uh, find a different investor home. And, um, and again, we're not talking, you know, junk credits here. We're talking... This is a, a high single A, double, low double A issuer. So this is high high grade credit. Um, and the mutual the, funds. So yes, go, they're, go they're, they're experiencing they're outflows, so they don't have cash gotcha. to purchase. Right. That's, that's what's going on. They're yeah. experiencing outflows, yep. so they're not buying new issues. And then um, the other part of your question, I don't really know the answer to. Um, from, from my perspective in terms of um, – you know, cracks and, and things like that, you know, to me, it's just more supply and demand being equivalent in having a, um, and f- when I'm, when I'm representing the issuer and not my personal account, uh, you know, we want calm water. So I price a lot of bonds say two weeks after the fed meeting where there's kind of like, a, a, um, and I put it on my client's timeline. I'll call it event risk. So I'll put event risk. That's how I call, talk about the Fed meeting. It's, it's event risk. So we want to sort of be in between event risks where we we can reestablish the new normal for the market, the new yield curve that bonds will will move away um, at. And right now, you know, we don't know where that that is at. You know, we're we're at a new level of price discovery post Powell's comments of, you know, we're going to blow up the whole thing. So. Um, I'm hoping that next week things firm up, but again, I don't have any bond issues to sell until I think July 7th is our next couple. So we blew out a bunch here and then we have this lag and we have two, three, four, five, uh, six, we'll have six bond issues, uh, over a seven day period from the seventh to the 14th. Other than that, we, we don't have anything. We sort of plan our stuff around the event risk. So um, the other thing I wanted to just I'll leave with just so in full disclosure, I know everyone's bragging about that they're up this year um, and I'm I'm really happy for you in a lot of ways. But in some ways, I hate you. I am not up this year. So um, just so uh, we, you know, full disclosure, I am uh, I am down three point nine eight percent on the year, which uh, for a guy that does pretty shitty in in stocks. And that's why I like these notebook calls is because. I get to hear about stocks and and all the options and all the things that I'm probably really not that great at. And the reason I subscribe to Hedge Eye, um, I'm, I'm learning. I'm getting better. But um, you know, when it comes to the muni space, I've done pretty well. So down, down three and change. Them. Down three and change is like being up when the markets are down twenty five to thirty five percent. So well, I appreciate that. I, I, did, I, I did. I did listen to Coach McCullough and he said, get the fuck out. And I did. And I literally I did. I sold everything. And, you know, I, I didn't get out perfectly, but I got out a lot better than uh, a lot of people. And probably most importantly, and on a serious note, um, I got my kids 
um, 529 accounts out. And uh, I did pull up their accounts the other day, and one of the mutual funds they were in was down 36%. Um, you know, oh, wow. that's my kids, that's my kids education. And yep. we're talking, we're talking American funds. We're not talking anything, you know, exotic here. We're talking American funds, 529 accounts. So it's yeah. real. Um, I actually have made a lot of money this year in terms of my hedge eye subscription in just having somebody in a team tell me, look, you need to get out. And there's no shame in my approach of being 80 80.4% cash today, taking Mike Taylor's path to the bottom of events and not focusing on price and waiting for the opportunity to go long again. You know, that may be what's best for Brian. And, and I think that's okay. It absolutely is okay. And I, I don't think anybody on here is, uh, everybody can speak for themselves. I don't think anybody's bragging about being up. I think if we were just asked a general question, and answered yes. Yeah, no, no. I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm jealous, but I'm happy for everyone. So, so with that, answer, um, okay. yeah, go ahead. I was just going to, anyone that's really interested in watching the fixed income market, Lipper Fund Flows puts out a report. I think it's like every Thursday night. Um, you have to pay for to like drill down to see exactly like what funds are reporting, what like outflows or inflows. But the very high level is free. It's like on the front page of the website. So like you could probably log on right now to like just Google it, Lipper Fund Flows, uh, L-I-P-P-E-R. And it'll give you like equity, mutual fund, uh, inflows or outflows, uh, corporate bond fund, inflows or outflows, muties, et cetera. Um, so you can, you can sort of watch that and see if there's like a turnaround there. So that was, that was Lipper, right? L I P O R. No, no, uh, L I P P E R. Yep. Oh, okay. sorry. Sorry. Thanks. That was, no, my bad. Uh, <laughs> that, made, that makes way more sense. <laughs> I think you were thinking LIBOR. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, my, my fault. <laughs> sorry, man. It's uh, we've been going for almost two hours. You know, sometimes my, my brain, uh, yeah, like, refocus, majority refocus. Uh, well, thanks, right. uh, thanks, Robert. Yeah, I'm gonna Brian, no, I'm gonna go join party. the pizza party here yeah, and man, pool party. Enjoy. And thanks appreciate you guys. Sharing. Yeah, and I um, and just for those that you know, when Brian came up, he mentioned the roadmap that he. Uh, he took notes on. I did share that in the in the uh, tweet nest. So, uh, by all means, go kind of bookmark that. It's been a great one. It was uh, based off of uh, a one on one really I had with uh, Mike Taylor. Uh, great convo, Mike T. Always, uh, always, always good to kind of pick his brain. And um, that setup was, I think, what I can't remember the date, but it was, I believe, back in May eighteenth. May, right? Yeah, May. Right? May eighteenth. And think about how many things have happened yeah. since May 18th that would have sucked you back in, right? I know. That's uh, that's fascinating. Agreed. Basically a month. Mike T, that's like a month, man. Uh, yeah. And that was the last thing. options expiry, I guess. 20th May yeah, it really was the last option. Right? Yeah, that's awesome. So, talk, hey. about, talk about timely, Mike T, to come back on here, bud. Um, yeah, that was uh, – I can't believe it. It feels like a lifetime ago. Month it ago. does. 30 May. days. <laughs> May 18th. That was uh, Hedge Eye Live weekend, too. Uh, wow. Yep. That's uh, – yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, where I got to meet Mike T in person and and Michael Green, and Nancy Davis. I didn't actually get to see her there, but she was there. Um, I missed her. Uh, but anyway, we let's move on. Um, hey, hey Robert. Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, you, you did have your hand, uh, hand up. Sorry about that. I, I just think it's important to note, and I don't think we've – I know we've talked about bonds, yields, et cetera, but I think it's important to note uh, something Keith mentioned the other day, but – now even the two-year risk range is greater than the 30-year risk range. Um, I, these treasury yields are, are – they're signaling you're talking, something. Are you talking about like the top end of the – Top end of the risk ranges on, on the 10-year yeah, and two-year are greater than the 30-year, 357, 356 yeah, versus 352. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to clarify what – yep, okay. Yeah, so I think it's important to note that uh, a couple weeks ago – the treasury was still bidding on some government auctions and a few of us were scratching our heads, but uh, come to realize um, QT didn't technically start until the 15th of this month. So where most people were thinking the beginning of the month, QT just started on the 15th. And I don't know, 
I, I just don't know how much of a role that plays, um, if it is playing a role at all. But I think it's definitely important to note. I there could be a possibility, and this is narrative speculation. Call it what you will. There could be a possibility that we don't really know. Well, let me let me rephrase. The treasury markets could be signaling things that we don't necessarily anticipate or the last 15, 20 years of history doesn't necessarily provide when the biggest buyer of treasuries over that period of time or one of them is out. Right. So I don't know where to go with it. I I just think it's definitely something to watch. As I mentioned, I'm out of all my bonds. Uh, I mentioned that on Twitter. I'm out of all my bonds. I don't mind revisiting at some point in time. I think the 30 year with a lower risk range is saying, hey, you know, recession is recession is coming or, or you know, the economy is slowing where the, the short end of the risk range is playing off what the Fed is saying. Um, but at the same time, I just think that we need to be mindful that this is really the first time that the Fed is doing the tightening with hiking rates while saying there's no sign of a slowdown at the same time doing QT. So no one really understands or knows what that impact's going to bring because we really haven't seen it in, in this large scale. Uh, so definitely just something to be mindful of. And I don't think we mentioned it tonight. So uh, just mentioning that. And by, by the way, QT is 95, $95 billion a month. Think, think about that. Like the, tr- the Fed has to come in and sell bonds every day. And then you as the buyer, like, why would you buy that if you know there's more for sale tomorrow? Is it really seven and a half billion for the first couple of months until September when it becomes 95? I thought I thought it was uh, 95 to start. I think it's, I, I may be wrong. I, I, I think it's 47 and a half and then it's 95 because they, they doubled it uh, three months or four months. But again, I'm not regardless. About, I'm, regardless, it's it's 47 and a half billion and 95 billion in a couple months. E- either way, it, it, it's it's QT. It's size. The only thing the Fed has going for them right now is the tight labor market. But like that's already showing, trying to show, tr- starting to show cracks, I think. And I think it's without I question showing cracks. Yep. I think as soon as as soon as that starts going the other way, like because that's a, like that'll be like a huge number, just like CPI is like the unemployment rate. Well, as soon as that starts ticking upwards, there'll be not only political pressure, but now it's one of the Fed's mandates. And then I think they have to start pausing. I don't I don't think they get to I don't think they get to actively sell that much off the balance sheet. I think they get to roll more off. But like it, it's going to be bad. That's that's my general opinion. Yeah, I mean, I think- the, only, the only slightly good news is that the move came off of its. Uh, Recent high, uh, so that's that, that's 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 I guess one good good component. Uh, we'll see if it uh, starts putting in. You know, anyway, yeah, the, the move is is not in a good spot. But uh, all right. Um, other side, do you have any other commentary, buddy? Or no, I'd just love to hear what Mike has to say about MBS. Yeah, X two, you can't wait to speak. Um, yeah, did you want to share hey, some of your insight on the credit, man? Yeah, I um, thanks for. Uh... Thanks for uh, absolutely. Let me let me uh, share some some thoughts. There's two things that I wanted to, to say. One is that the you know the markets and the commentary you know that's out there is mostly about economics, and obviously that there's a reason why. But you know, alongside of that is the structure of the of of capital markets. And like like someone told me yesterday, they put it in a really good way. They said the stock market is the outer layer of skin. And then as you keep going closer to the important parts of the body, you know, you get, you get the real, uh, the real meat of what, of what's happening in, in, in capital markets, the credit markets and the structure and foundation of how that, how everything rolls and stock market is kind of like the last, the last part before, you know, it's a terrible uh, analogy, I guess, the way I'm describing it, but the stock market is like the, the end result. And if you look at the structure of what's going on foundationally with capital markets right now, and you talk to some guys that are in there, it is not good. It's not 2008, but it is really not good. Things are really kind of freezing up. Risk is off. Uh, and uh, I talked to some guys I used to sit with on the desk yesterday, and they're at big shops. There's complete hiring freeze. The entire um, shop, I, this particular shop, 
and I'm sure it's like that across the board. Um, they are coming in, and it, and I can tell you from 08, the same exact kind of lead up to it in 07 was you know reducing headcount, reducing expenses, and then 08 hit. So I think we're in the we're in the September through December 2007 part of of this process. Maybe a little bit later, you know, based on what the stock market has done, but from the like the structural integrity of capital markets, we are not there yet. Uh, and as far as MBS, it's not that they went no bid, uh, but if you try to come in and take, you know, big, decent size, you know, you want a bid for, you know, you want a bid for 500 million or 250 million, no bid. And that is a big problem. That's why mortgage rates are flying. They probably won't stop. Um, you can easily see seven to eight percent mortgages by the end of the month or end of July. So there's more pain coming. Look at if you look at some of the mortgage rates the last three, four days. They are down significantly, and it's just they're writing down the the price of mortgages, which is obviously the other side of the rate. And uh, so there's problems out there, no doubt. So, I mean, while everyone's kind of focused on the economics of the Fed and whatever, the structure is a big deal. So Yo, I just pulled up, I just pulled up, <laughs> I just pulled up uh, annually capital. Holy yep. shit, that chart looks terrible. <laughs> Yeah, we, we've talked about structure a lot. The first time Nancy Davis was on this call, structure is huge, and it, it's going to crack, in my opinion. I don't know when, but it, 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 it's got to crack. Yeah, Nancy, it's a good segue. Um, well, what are you seeing? I mean, your product certainly acted uh, well today, did its job, but um, what, uh, what are you seeing out there? Yeah, no, I, I, I was. Just... I, I know it's a very open ended question. But... <laughs> well, I think, um, you know, there, there are a lot of different um, volatilities out there. And um, although the move index is, a, is really easy to see, bond volatility, it's, it's short dated bond volatility. So it's more like gamma sensitivity, more like the VIX. Um, but longer dated rate vol, if you look at like swaption vol, um, and I can uh, put a chart in the. Uh, in, um, I can send it to you, Robert, if you want on, on yeah. DM, but I, I will, it, yeah. it went up today quite a bit. Um, that's why okay. both both Ival and BNDB were up strongly today, even though they have different things in them and it, it's higher rate ball. And I think I think with going back, the reason I raised my hand was about the balance sheet unwind. The caps are in place for three months. So it's um, it's uh, and then they're going to be raised for the next three months. And the Fed really didn't address it yesterday other than saying, they're going to be using it more as a monetary policy tool. But I think, you know, they've been pretty public about saying they're not going to own mortgages long term on the balance sheet and checking out the SOMA holdings is super important. I made a tweet about it uh, a couple weeks ago about like here are the websites to look at the SOMA holdings because that is what the Fed actually bought in the open market for um, in the QE purchases. And that's probably what they're actually going to be selling um, eventually, like right now, it's just roll off with the caps, but it's uh, it's getting exciting. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's one way to put it. Yeah, Nancy, and you mentioned that I think last week when you jumped on, uh, you, you you talked about the move, and and so again, so if you want to know more about that volatility complex inside of the the fixed income market, uh, definitely go listen to the notebook review from last Wednesday. Uh, Nancy schooled all of us on uh, on on bond volatility, and uh, yes, so I, I agree. You are 100 percent correct. I did reference move. I should be better. I will be better. No, um, no, move's yeah. good. Move, like it's a it's easy to pull up. It's a great index. Um, I know. Uh, I see. Uh, Michael Green and uh and Michael. Uh, the other Michael is. They're both on the phone, and and their colleague Harley created it. It's a great index. It's awesome to watch. It's just not. It's like, it's more um more like the VIX, but for bonds, and the yeah. rates market is more the swaption market. Okay. Um, which is globally, you know, every single bond issuer around the world, whether it's, you know, AstraZeneca or Sony or Disney, nobody pays for treasuries, right? They don't use treasuries to hedge, they use swaps. So it's just a way bigger market. And um, it captures, uh, 
it's a it's actually a different level of volatility they tend to trade in the same wines but it's it's all like also the tenor so vega has really been picking up as well so longer dated vol has been going up it was very very backward dated meaning the vol curve was very downward sloping it's still downward sloping i think it's a i think it's a, a nice time to and you mentioned Great you mentioned baller. this uh, last week too. You mentioned this last week too. What what, um, what was the uh, Bloomy kind of ticker to pull it up on uh, for this to to monitor that swaps? Well, they're all. I think different. you meant, are they all different? Okay. Yeah, like you can pull up um, depending on the tenor, but like you know you can look at a one year, ten year, for instance, maybe as okay. just Eric, and that's um, that ticker is USS. And like Nancy, my name zero one one zero currency, and that's okay. uh, the U.S. swaps involved for the one year, ten year, just as a, a bench it. gives you a little bit of a basically like a longer dated option has more Vegas sensitivity, and a shorter dated option has more gamma sensitivity, and sure. so you want more Vega when vol is going up because you make more when vol goes higher, basically. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes per- perfect sense. Awesome. Um, thank you. All right, so uh, we've been kind of at this for about two hours now, but uh, I know a couple of folks jumped up to speak. I think Doctor or something, Doctor Duraj. I don't know if um, you had a commentary or question for the group, but uh, I can. I'll give you the floor of the mic, and then we might just try to wrap up here. I know there's some guys that are requesting to speak, but I think we're gonna. My kids just came home from the playground. Um, Viewers, do you have a question? Uh, hey guys, uh, just uh, uh, thanks for letting me come. I was very learning. It's a very informative session. Thanks for organizing. Absolutely. And I just want to emphasize again, uh, I do work, uh, a little bit of my time goes in biotech analytic works for certain uh, companies. I follow them very closely and I do that. But yeah, somebody just mentioned it, which is so true about uh, hiring freeze and now firing as well. Um, in the biotech sector, uh, very highly paid jobs uh, uh, are being restructured now. Um, and uh, as you know, a lot of the drug companies don't have good cash flow and earnings is an issue. So uh, currently expenditure cutting is already happening. Um, I We do anticipate further interest rates hikes, maybe even 75 to even 100 basis point in future. So uh, very, very crucial times. Uh, uh, everybody's repositioning the portfolio, looking into risk assessment, and uh, uh, currently some of the growth stocks are already at value, like valuation stocks can already almost like that. But thank you so much. Uh, very informative. Just wanted to add that point. Thanks. No, oh, awesome. Appreciate it. And Mike, I know you jumped on last week, I think, to maybe ask Nancy a question. Did you have a follow-up or any other so this is Mike, uh, uh, yeah, hey man, yeah, Welcome back. yeah, thanks, appreciate it. Follow yeah. up for Nancy there, specifically as it relates to uh, MBS uh, and the runoff there. You're coming on runoff. So when these were acquired, uh, and what I understand it for the duration of them, uh, how are they actually running off? Because the uh, with with rates right now, there's not a lot of refi going on. At least I would assume not anyway. Uh, and the Fed's you know, announced a couple of days ago that during this two-week period, they're buying $4.6 billion of MBS. So that implies that they've exceeded the cap, right? So how is that actually happening? Can you comment on that? Yeah, it's a really, really good point because um, just to break that down, like so refi is basically homeowners in the United States are along the option to prepay their loan whenever they want. It doesn't exist that way in all uh, markets, like for instance, in Canada, you have penalties if you prepay. So it depends on the market. But in the U.S., the homeowners are along the option to prepay. And because generally, you know, the Fed's been hiking rates and more hawkish, interest rates are higher. So homeowners are not prepaying as much. And so I was a little, I felt kind of like yesterday, I was like sort of like, where's the beef? Because I was kind of expecting Powell to talk a little bit more about the balance sheet as a monetary policy tool. Like he sort of was like, we're going to use it as a monetary policy tool, but he said nothing material about it. Um, It definitely feels like a topic that is going to be in the, you know, should be in the front seat going forward because policy hikes are just killing the economy. Like, I don't know what they think 
that's going to do. But, you know, there's almost another 200 basis points of hikes priced in just this year alone, like five and a half months left to go. Like, think about it. It's like 75, 75. You know, it's like it's not doing anything to slow inflation. So I was sort of, you know, kind of disappointed with them not really saying anything about it. But I think, you know, eventually I would expect the Fed's going to announce a program to outright sell mortgages on their balance sheet um, and specifically tie a target target that they've been pretty transparent about not wanting to own mortgages long term and only having treasuries but with higher policy rates the slowdown of prepayments is going to increase and the caps are for the first three months and then they increase in three months so it's a uh i don't know i don't remember who said it but it was it's 30 billion and then 17 and a half billion for the next three months and then it goes up so it's uh it's definitely a, a be really careful wherever you have especially if you have short duration fixed income a lot of short duration is uh got a lot of spread risk right it, there's only two types of bond risk there's rate risk and then there's spread risk so if you don't take a lot of rate risk and it's shorter duration typically a lot of those funds that are outside just treasuries have a lot of spread risk whether it's credit spread or um emerging markets or foreign uh, or international or um, spread risk with mortgages, which is agency spread risk or structured credit. Anytime you see these credit acronyms, just be wary. I was looking at a couple of mutual funds the other day. I was like, oh my gosh, they're all short duration in name, but they have, you know, CMBX and RMBX and ABS and CDO and CLO. It's just be careful when you know what you own. It's don't, don't think short duration is safe. If it's not governments and it doesn't take a lot of rate risk and it has a high coupon, it's got other stuff in there. Maybe some Luna. (laughs) 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 Uh, Tease, a tease. All right. Well, uh, no, I I agree. Like, I was looking at some of these mutual funds the other day and I was just like, it's crazy what these short duration funds, like, some of them have like variant swaps and CMBX and all sorts of like absolutely insane stuff in there. Um, ETFs generally, I would say big picture, like high level, I think ETFs are a lot more regulated because it's historically much more of a, you know, individual investor market. Mutual funds tend to actually be more like out on their skis, if I can make these are broad stroke comments, but mutual funds actually have a lot more leeway and there's a lot more like weird stuff in mutual funds. Um, from my experience. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense. Um, yeah, no, that, uh, and the good news, Nancy, is that you and I get to talk more about this on, uh, on Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. I can't wait. I totally joined because I'm always interested in the meeting market. Um, so I, I joined just to listen, but yeah, yeah, yeah no, awesome. it was a good, it was a good combo. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, for those, uh, I'll be, unfortunately, Twitter doesn't allow you to do multiple or like send out multiple reminders uh, for spots, for spaces. But uh, Nancy's uh, been kind enough to agree to sit down with me on uh, Tuesday, the 21st at 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern uh, for, for 101. So we'll, um, so we're going to yeah have a great, uh, great convo. So hopefully everybody can kind of uh, tune back in uh, next, next, next week. And uh, we'll have a uh, whole fixed income discussion and, uh, she's, as I said, you know, just kind of enough to, to share her thoughts and, and, and that kind of thing. We're doing it at a, at a nice time, a morning time. So hopefully some, some folks from Europe will be able to join um, as well as, uh, you know, those early birds out on the West Coast. So, um, so yeah, so that's good. So, so thank you again, Nancy. I'll, um, I'll be sending out a, a reminder uh, later tonight and then, um, and, and yeah, so we'll, uh, we'll get that out there and you can put that on, on your calendars. Awesome. Can't awesome. wait. Yeah, it's good. Good yeah. stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Good stuff. Good, well, another great, great um, session tonight. So thank you, everyone, for, for contributing, for your time. Uh, it's uh, definitely always, always a lot but of fun. Wait, but wait, there's more. Oh. <laughs> What's that, Taylor? I'm, I'm sorry I was off for most of the time. I was talking to the smartest ARB guy there is. Oh, sick. All right, yeah. let's do it. All well, right, we, well, I can't do that. I can't real, do that. Let's do it. Real-time crap here. Uh, does not like Activision. Thinks this Lena Can situation is going to mm. uh, go go to uh, court. Okay, the right. 
support and and the and they're not the deals may not get done because she is just not nice uh and the the fella i don't want to say who it is he does like vmware but it's okay. going to be a little bit of a long road and volatile but he thinks that one gets done will All not right. be vision and it has uh, with the Xbox and Sony uh, dominating, and and there the this uh, this FTC uh, does not like big uh, companies getting more concentrated in anything, and that's really the take home. So now we talked about it for like forty minutes. So I don't. <laughs> no, oh, wow. that's, that's awesome. Real uh, time. The real time, guys. You hear it, hear it, hear it here first on the weekly notebook review. So thanks, Mike T. That's awesome. So just to, as as a recap, we were you know we were talking about kind of having a little uh, creating a little basket in the portfolio of, of merger arbs, uh, in particular that have you know basically cash cash um, deals on the table. And, and one was VMware, and the other one was uh, Activision, so ATVI. And uh, and Mike was kind enough to go uh, talk to this guy at, at uh, it was Millennium, right? That you spoke to. I cannot. Confirm. <laughs> no worries. No worries. My fault. Never so, mind. Mike, uh, any any notes on sale, uh, sale point, and uh, money gram? Just from a thought process. Uh, no. Um, okay. No worries. Say, he did say that. Uh, so far as the um, the Arab guys go, he says there's a sea of guys getting blown out right now. Uh, every, yes. Yes. That's what is happening. There's been a lot of cowboys in there, and and they've lost. Now they're down ten percent, and it's over. He said, "There's guys in the in in the big shops. Guys are getting blown out left and right. Um, yeah. Everyone on their back foot." And his book, I know it because I know how small his book is. It's it's probably about one fifth the size that he normally is, even less than that. Probably about fifteen percent the normal size. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So. And makes sense, right. yeah. Makes sense. But the wall has gone up, yep. And uh, usually in these ARB names, uh, the implied wall is in the range of three to six percent, but right now it is almost uh, at an average of sixteen percent. Uh, plus the spreads on an average across the entire basket is almost like twelve to sixteen percent, not counting Twitter. This is excluding Twitter. So it's a pretty high spread. Uh, these spreads tend to be tight, usually around yeah, four to five percent. Yeah, very tight. Yeah, uh, great commentary. Well, that's an even better way to end it, uh, guys. So thank you, uh, Mike. Always a pleasure, buddy. You, you bet. Know, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good luck. Um, does Does Max have another race this weekend? I know he's like racing no. all the time, but no race this weekend. All right. Well, uh, best of luck out there, and uh, thank you all again, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you next week. Next uh, next Wednesday will be an evening session. Uh, so 8.30, notebook review. Uh, but um, on the 21st, on, on Tuesday, we'll have Nancy Davis on at 10 a.m. So uh, look forward to that. All the best, everyone. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Hey, Rob, thanks.